What did I learn when I was a kid and my parents put me to the church Sunday school? As a thumbnail, this video has a tank and now everyone is thinking, how are those two things related at all? Church and these tools of destruction. It's going to make sense and be logical when the story unrolls. Kind of. It was actually not being held on Sundays, but it was kind of an after-school club for children. Anyways, the structure of the teachings and what we did was still quite much the same as you would have in Sunday schools. So we had teachings about faith and we were having all kinds of crafting projects or drawing. Sometimes we went out, etc. I had a friend there. I'm not going to mention his name, but I liked hanging out with him very much. He was quite much in the same age as I was, so very much a kid. The kind of guy everyone wanted to be friends with. Friendly, always smiling, funny and very smart. He is actually a real university scientist nowadays and I'm here making YouTube videos. I guess we were not made from the same material. Okay, okay, let's stay on the topic. It's important for the story also to tell that he was from a missionary family and a big part of his childhood he spent in one Asian country. I'm not going to dox the country either here though, so let's not mention that name either. So. That day in the church after school club, the teachers had prepared something interesting for us. They would give each of us our own piece of clay from that bigger part of clay they had. I still remember how they were cutting huge piece of clay with a knife and giving parts of it to everyone. They told us that today we would be allowed to sculpt anything we wish to from our own part. That was a really nice job for me because I really liked clay jobs. I wasn't very skilled in it, but I really really liked doing clay works. Even at home I would go and find clay from some natural location such ditches and I would collect my own clay and do some of my own clay works with it. I think I was probably signing when I understood what we were allowed to do that day. So, we were rolling our clay pieces in our little hands and we were trying to figure out something worth making out of it. I cannot exactly remember what I was thinking and talking with my friend, but I think it was probably something like this. Should I make a dog? Ah, I already made a dog at home from Play-Doh and it was not that nice. What about horse then? Ah, the long legs for sure will make sure that we will fail the horse project. What about a cat then? Uh, everyone else is already doing cats and dogs and we wanted to do something nice and original with this special piece of clay. So, finally my friend told a little story for me. The country where he was with his missionary family there used to be on the street some really skilled artists who were doing clay works for tourists. He told how they would use the clay to make realistic tanks and other vehicles which then would be sold to the tourists. That sounded like a really good idea to my little kid ears and I was thinking of the artists on the streets doing their clay works and it really felt amazing how they could do such details and nice tanks from this material. Of course I have never seen photos of those tanks, but my friend was able to convince me that their clay models were so nice and detailed. The time was not like this time we are living now. In that time we didn't have any sort of a reference photos or anything to look ideas from. Basically, we instead were working from our memories, and we were kids. The teachers would also be telling us that do not let the bubbles be inside of your models because 
it would make them crack in the oven. So we were extra careful with that aspect also and tried to not let any bubbles be happening inside of our models. We had wooden sticks that were supposed to be used to push holes into our models so that there would not be any bubbles or other cavities. I didn't like the idea of having random holes in my tank, but that was the thing that we had to do and I was also doing it under the tank. Even when these were tanks made with a great low, if you even can say so, I wouldn't still go saying that these were very exceptionally nice looking tanks. I cannot remember very well the tank my friend made, but I can remember my own tank. The chains were these two clay tubes and the body of the tank was that kind of a blob of clay. Over that there was another blob of clay which was supposed to be the tower of the tank. And finally, as a final decoration, we used clay to create this kind of a tube which was supposed to be the barrel of the wall model. However, the barrel was having a problem. It didn't stay in the correct position. Being made out of clay, it will start slowly bending down. After trying few times, we figured out a method that we thought was a very good and clever. We accepted that our tanks will be at least a little bit smaller and from that additional clay we created yet another clay model, whose only purpose was to hold the barrel in the correct position, way up in the tower and not let it bend or drop down. When we finally finished our tank models and everybody else also finished their models, we were asked to return the products to the teacher. And there was a nice collection of all kinds of clay models. Dogs, cats, bunnies and I bet there also was some snails. I have a photographic memory and I still can see the metallic tray with baking paper full of clay models. Sadly my memory is not that good so that I would be able to say which all types of models everyone did. Anyways, with all of those other models there also were those two tanks with their barrels supported with the support structure we created and everything was looking good and according to the plan. The idea was that when we came back to the after school club the clay models would be hardened in the ceramic oven and we could get them back as a finished product. So the week went and it was again a day to go back to this after school club and my friend also was there. So soon when everyone was there and sitting at the tables the teacher went to take the models and everyone would get their model from that tray. But there was something strange with our tanks. Neither of them had their barrels connected to the towers. Instead, the barrels were on the tray next to the tanks and the clever superstructures we made were also lying next to the tanks on their sides. Everything scattered around. It was a sad view. At this point, it would be impossible to say if those were tanks at all or something completely else. The barrels were the thing that made them to be tanks. Now, when the barrels dropped out, you could as rightfully say them to be bad models of ladybugs or Volkswagen Beetles or something. I can't perfectly remember the wording the teacher used to tell us what happened, but I think it was something like this. Sadly, your models didn't hold up in the heat of the oven and the barrels dropped because of it. Maybe there were some bubbles. Without saying words, I took my tank ladybug model, the barrel tube and the additional super structure, which no longer felt so clever at all, and I went back to my place. I remember that I felt something was in my throat. If I would have been alone, 
it's possible that in fact I would have been crying. Even when I didn't say anything, I was still thinking a lot. Why didn't I do a dog? Didn't I have a good plan? I did place the barrel on the model very carefully. Also, didn't I pour the clay with water to make sure that the surface would be smooth and all the seams be tight? Especially the barrel, because we already suspected it to be causing some problems for us. The superstructure was a good plan to prevent this from happening to our models. We also tried to take care that there were no bubbles in the models. Didn't we? I at least did. I really did my best. I covered the tank hollow from bottom to make sure that it's bubble free. What's the problem then? Why do these kind of things happen to us? Now after all of those precautions, our models that were supposed to be nice tanks suddenly became garbage. So, we were sitting there silently looking at our wrecked models until my friend said something. He kind of drilled his words into my mind and now I don't even wanna forget his words anymore. His words would often come back to my mind when something negative happens to me. He said, Ei se mitään. Jeesus on paljon tärkeämpi. It's okay. Jesus is much more important. I didn't understand his words. I mean, I understood what the meaning of his words, but it kind of hurt me. We were in church school, but how is Jesus related to anything with these broken clay tank models? Now, I guess I'm a bit slow, but now as an adult I can finally say that I have understood it. Would the world somehow be better if the barrels didn't drop off? What actually was the important lesson here? Do not let any bubbles be inside of your clay models. Well, I agree that it's important to have the models be bubble free to survive the oven, but Jesus is much more important than that. There is a story in the Bible about a man named Job. Based on what was written there, he was a very rich man. Now, this is not a prosperity gospel. When we read his story from the book, we can see that he lost many things during his lifetime. My suffering with the clay tanks is nothing compared to his loss. In fact, he and everybody around him had full series of all kinds of accidents. He had servants who were killed by the enemy. The enemy also took his cattle and his sheep were burned in a fire and the shepherds also died in it. Chaldeans robbed all of his camels and those servants whose job was to take care of them also were killed. His sons and daughters were in the house of the eldest son and the house collapsed over them, killing all of them. That's just horrible. So what would Job say after all of these awful events around him? The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And Job became very sick. His body was full of abscesses and he took a piece from a broken clay pot and he sat down on the pile of ass scraping himself and his broken skin with that clay. And his wife said, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. To which Job answered, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble?
Later in the same book, Job says these words. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead, or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Who is this Redeemer who at the end is standing on earth? In the Finnish translation it's been said that he will be the last standing on the ashes. Job is talking about Jesus. He knew that God will be sending a Redeemer on earth. Someone who will be having the final words over everything. Redeemer of all of our bad deeds and all the trouble we have here on earth. So Job understood that Jesus is much more important than the troubles he, his family and everybody else around him encountered. After all of those troubles, Job got his health back and everything else that he had lost during these events. In fact, God gave him two times the amount of everything he had before. Double the amount of sheep and cattle double the amount of camels and so on. But kids, he used to have seven sons and three daughters, those you remember who died under the collapsing house. He then got another seven sons and three daughters. The same amount he lost. Why is that? Because he always got the double amount of everything and he actually didn't lose his kids. They died on earth but not eternally. Every one of us will die at some point, but Jesus gave us a promise that we will not die eternally if we put our faith in him. If you read the Bible, you can see that even the Old Testament is constantly referring to Jesus. The kids died in faith. They were waiting for Job in the afterlife. When Job himself died, I believe he met his kids also again. Now, Job already has been dead, in fact, thousands of years, but his words indeed have been written in thousands of ways into scrolls and books, just like he hoped for, and most likely also carved to stone by someone, and we can read his words. It doesn't matter what happens to our body if our hearts are connected to Jesus. God is capable of changing our losses to victory, and when we, all of us, will have to leave this planet somehow at some day. If we made our faith to be in Jesus, then even death is a victory for us.